You want fast action, outdoor action, real man-sized action. Well, here's action that tops them all in the combat branches of today's Army. And now if you qualify, you can choose the action branch you want. Pick the artillery. Get in on the exciting missile and anti-missile field. One of our biggest thing was to investigate claims regarding missile mishaps. Uh, where a missile would be blown up in the air and the pieces fall down and, and either kill things like cattle or destroy property. We had a cow that literally one small piece of a missile hit it directly in the head and nowhere else. You can actually see this, the piece of the missile, the splatter mark, and the stagger of the cow before it fell over and died. It just hit it right on the top of the head and nowhere else. Wow. You know? We had to figure out somebody got the chicken coop disturbed. We got to figure out how much chickens are worth. You know how much, how many eggs would they produce or lifespan? We would all take a break. Then we had the missile uh, schedule and we would stop working and all walk outside and watch missiles go up. <laughs> pick the fast-moving armor. Work with the world's most up-to-date tanks, or pick the mechanized infantry. The fast action branch for fast action outdoor guys. Uh, we were told, of course, uh, in basic training and overseas that uh, if we did our job as infantry, uh, we wouldn't get home. Whichever branch you pick, today's army is the most mechanized freedom force ever assembled. We have built a, a system, so-called defense department, that uh, can kill more people faster than any other country in the world can. You're supposed to have your dog tags and he just had this row of, of piece symbols on his uh, like on a chain necklace. There's so many different nuances with these issues, you know, war and peace and all that. So if you're for fast action, if you're an action kind of guy, take a long, strong look at today's army. Pick one of the army's three combat branches. The artillery. You knew the blast was gonna come, but when it came, it still was unnerving. And then you would smell the, the cordite, the, um, the powder smell and the windows would each blast would swing open with the impact and then slam back down again and I, I think you know it you don't you just kind of mat you're using your imagination and f realizing what a five inch shell thrown 15 18 miles you know and uh, impact and stuff like that it, it just kind of gets to you after a while yeah. I, yeah. armor or infantry. What's the next step? We have to keep testing new weapons, so we either have to be in a war or we have to find someone like Israel that will fight for us and test our weapons. So that is my attitude. Uh, and I, I can't um, have a positive attitude about the military because of that. I'm getting used to a new normal, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's interesting, it's, it's hard because I was expecting I would have more of the standard narrative. I ended up with five stress fractures, one left tibia, two in my right tibia, and one in each of my first metatarsals. Um, plantar fasciitis, both, uh, you know, both feet, uh, Achilles tendonitis, both um, patellofemoral pain syndrome, which doesn't really mean anything other than my knees hurt a lot and would puff up. It turns out uh, I had a chronic exertional compartment syndrome, um, which was just diagnosed mm, about three months ago uh, by Kaiser. And I had surgery for it uh, four weeks ago today. Um, this was something that is uh, the, the most common population for it to happen to is you know, about 20 years old, um, military recruits. <laughs> and the army didn't catch it and didn't care to catch it. Yes, Marines all look good, don't they? Top fighting men. Sort as if they knew their jobs, knew how to take care of themselves. They weren't born this way, you know. They had to learn. And that is one of the problems with veterans coming back, even from a, a non-combat uh, situation. They're still taught to sit on their emotions. Guys sitting upright, you know, radio men named Fenrich and He'd, uh, he'd jump out of his rack, we were four high in the compartment, and he'd jump out of his rack and, incoming, incoming, where's my rifle, where's my rifle? And the bunk lights would click on, and this first class signalman 
would say, kick Fenrich, get, he's back in Vietnam again, wake him up and get him back in his rack. And I cried when I was wounded, and I always felt like a baby about that. And they, I learned that everybody cries when, when they're wounded in combat. I remember that one guy came and slapped me because I was screaming. And uh, he said, don't be such a baby. Well, I felt like a baby all my life until I got some of that. Uh, back then, national news always started with body count. The very first thing they did, they placed on a, on a screen was, how many American soldiers died today, yesterday? How many got wounded? How many of the enemy got killed? How many got wounded? And it was frightening. A grenade thrown at a jeep near Saigon injured five Americans, none seriously, and a guerrilla attack in the Mekong Delta killed a South Vietnamese woman and six children. Of course, in World War II, you were not, you were trained to leave your butt. Uh, the corpsmen were just behind us. And if you stop, that's two people out. And so we were taught to never stop for, for our friends. That was one of the hard things, hardest things to do. But they learned. They learned how to meet all kinds of situations. They learned about all their weapons, how to get the best out of them. And above all, they learned to have faith in their service. Military service is about doing something for somebody else. It's not about what you want. It's not about, you know, your, how rich you get or fulfilling your personal dreams or whatever. It had nothing to do with that. It's about self-sacrifice for the greater good, you know? and and um, so in that sort of sense, I think it really military service really helped me mature. It got got me away from simply thinking that it's all about me. Because the Marine Corps trains each and every one of them individually, gives each confidence in himself and in all other Marines. In combat, nobody is calling for anything because everybody is functioning together. They all know what has to happen. Um, you know what your buddy needs the same moment he does. He doesn't have to call. And you step in and help. Well, that kind of rapport, that kind of uh, bonding, uh, where you become part of a whole. And it's difficult for someone who hasn't had that to understand. What do you mean part of a whole? Well, there is a, a connection that you don't get any other way. I didn't feel like I really had any any claim or any stake or that I that I that I counted or mattered. And I also thought I was the only one that this happened to. And over the past several years, I've found other people who have had very similar experiences that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been it's been difficult because I felt like I've had this invalid experience. I think everybody personally felt that that's not going to happen to me. I know when we were overseas and, and in combat, I didn't write anything to my folks about what I was doing because I didn't need to. You know, it wasn't going to happen to me. And uh, then when I did get wounded, they were pretty shocked. Uh, I had a bad uh, wound, which uh, they were going to amputate my leg but a Dutch doctor pretty much saved it. Uh, so I was very fortunate there, but my folks got the telegram. My dad was in the army, and so he knew that seriously wounded in action meant I was going to come home without part of me. And uh, they had set that up with the army bureaucracy system so that my folks got that telegram, even though they changed uh, as I was going under the anesthesia. They changed their decision. I looked at it as a blessing because it kept me out of combat. You know, when you're wounded, you go back into combat. Uh, it kept me out for two months, and that was a real blessing. I was typically seven weeks out in the field, one week in. So that one week in, I taught I taught a class um, on demolition. But there was a, a fair amount of recreational time, party time, and I remember being in some of these GI bar, uh, beer halls 
at in Fubai, which is just outside of Wei, and that song would come on, I'm leaving on a jet plane. And everybody in that beer hall stood up and cheered because they couldn't wait to get, get home. The uproarious nature of every GI in that, that hall and how they were just taken to get home. An aviation cadet for training as a pilot, navigator, or bombardier. Here's a chance to get a ringside seat, or better still, a bird's eye view of the big fight. says, stay here, don't walk away, because if you do, I won't find you again. Then he turned around and walked away and says, stay there, and he just walked away. He didn't come back for hours. He didn't say anything to me, what I was supposed to do there or anything, he just said, stay there. So, um, so I'm sat in there in the middle of the desert, and after a while, I suddenly realized how quiet it was. It was just like, you don't hear any car engines, you don't hear any airplanes, no voices. No doors opening, closing, windows open. It was dead silent to the point that I could hear the slightest movements of lizards and birds and so forth. That even if they're far away over here, I would actually hear a little rustle off somewhere and I'd look now and I realized it's some small creature far, far away. Look, I, I actually went and got a psych degree because it was so difficult to understand my own person. And uh, I knew that once I got out that I was going back. I was never college bound prior to going uh -huh. in. Wow. No, I was not, wow. you know, didn't take the coursework that you should take in order to go to university. But when I got out, I knew a psych degree would help me understand myself and other people. I could do things I never physically and mentally that I never thought I could because they, part of training was to stress you mentally and see if you can withstand the, the mental stress, and I did, so in a certain sense, I, it helped, really helped me grow up. This, this sort of dual existence of the institution is soulless and utterly indifferent to any and all individuals, um, and is wasteful and irresponsible, um, and massive and it's the individuals in service that make it worth it. There's a lot of complexities and different calculations on every subject. Um, after I got out I just was one who wanted to know how you do conflict resolution and how you get along and, and, um, and how you diminish the uh, likelihood of, of conflict. I came home and house was beautiful and it was on Country Club Drive and and I've been living with 28 men in the size of your kitchen for a couple of years and it was all painted gray and depressing gray. It's called Hayes Gray but I always called it depressing gray and I just felt like you know just like out of sorts and like what's this all about you know and my folks were still uh, pro-war and so we had some really I'm moving back into their house but I am kind of this mm, thorn in their side as far as questioning their values and having arguments at the dinner table about what was what should have happened what was going on my dark moments and they come and go uh, I uh, I know how lucky I am, and I, I wonder why I was so chosen. You know, um, I'm just one to keep moving on. That's all I know how to do. There is life there, you know. That the, the, the sagebrush and all these other things that dry right now, after spring, it's fields of flowers. Sense of. Uh sense of destiny and loss in the same in the same same sentence that uh, and there's a sense of uh, you know why some people have such easy lives and other people have to go through this kind of experiences and I just uh, 
Mm, to put it to words. Kiss me and smile for me. Tell me that you wait for me. Hold me like you never let me go. Yeah.